Well, you guys asked for it, so here it is, my homebrew Spelljammer Space Combat Rules. Hi everybody, my name is Justin, and welcome to Game On, a show all about tabletop gaming, from board games to RPGs and everything in between. <laughs> um, turns out that one of my youngest viewers, uh, her name is Alice, she's just over a year old, so uh, she watches my videos. Uh, so hi Alice, uh, shout out to my youngest subscriber. <laughs> um, I... Uh, I didn't think that I would ever really put out a rule set for a lot of people to be looking at. Um, never wrote anything like this before, I kind of was using what I just wanted to use myself, and I've never really thought to put it to paper for other people to try to use, but you guys really wanted it. So I, you know, I got over a hundred people that asked for it. So I, first of all, I feel uh, humbled, so thank you so much for wanting to see my opinions on this. A couple months ago I put out a video that said Spelljammer Space Combat Explained and how if I was really wowed by WotC then I wouldn't use my own homebrew rules. And to be honest I was really wowed by WotC and the fact that they didn't write any rules. <laughs> so um, this is kind of my, uh, my, my rule set that you can use in lieu of the rules that Watsi put out in their Astral's Adventurer's Guide. So I'm going to try to paint in broad strokes today because if I went over everything, which I've recorded this video a couple times, and every single time the video has been like 40 minutes long. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep it uh, short and quick. Uh, I will have a link to this in the description as well as the pinned comment so you can follow along. I want to talk about some of the big things that I changed in this. And really the big thing that I changed was how combat is tracked, both time-wise and through uh, different steps. So the big thing that I changed in this game is, uh, for specifically for space combat ship-to-ship, -ship, turns are, or rounds are no longer six seconds, but they are six minutes. And that is because it allows each ship to kind of go as its own side and it allows everybody to do their own thing within that initiative. So let's say that you had a, your, your PCs rolled an initiative of like, I don't know, 15, and the enemy rolled an initiative of 11. The PCs get to go first and everybody in that ship gets to go. So uh, what's really nice about that is that you don't have to manage the people uh, individually within a ship doing things. Uh, you just say, okay, everybody on, in this ship gets to go on this initiative, and it's up to you on who wants to go first and who wants to do what. And then the other ship does it. And then at the end, um, we do a certain kind of roll to see if any of the crew members die, and then we go back to the top of the initiative. But you'll see that I have a couple different steps that I added to combat. We're going to talk about the command step really quickly. Before initiative is rolled, think of the command step as uh, that quick little pep talk that uh, Commander uh, Adama or... Uh, Kirk, Captain Kirk says or something on the bridge before they yell action stations like just that little like okay guys we can do this uh, command step and uh, I gave anybody uh, down here I have sub rules you'll see that I did my very best to uh, lay this out like you would see in a uh, player's handbook or in an adventurer's guide so I, I tried my best to use the the side uh, boxes and the right font and yada 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 and uh, with the command step, this happens before you roll for initiative. There's a couple different things um, that helps uh, kind of reward people for taking certain feats and uh, proficiencies. The inspiring leader feat will help with uh, your your whole side's uh, initiative and spell or uh, and skill checks. Uh, people with alert feat lets them get legendary actions for once a combat round. So or sorry, once a whole combat. So basically, if you have an alert feat, uh, somebody with the alert feat, it, it basically gives your ship the ability to take one of these legendary actions um, at any time during the combat, which I really like. And then I also wanted to reward people who have proficiency in cook's tools 
or brewer supplies so they can give a, a, a pl- uh, advantage to people who wanted to make a charisma check to try to give a plus one to their sides initiative. Basically, I'm trying to reward people for having backgrounds and tool proficiencies that can actually help <laughs> um, the uh, you know lesser used things that you don't always get to use in your games. And you'll see that later on in the actions that you can take during combat. So after you do the command step, that's when we're going to go to initiative. So this is when you're going to roll. Uh, the pilot is going to roll their intelligence, charisma, or wisdom, whatever it is. Uh, their uh, their modifier that they're using to uh, fly and they're gonna roll and that's gonna add to the initiative uh, and then plus whatever uh, comes from the command step and everything from the command step is going to stack so if you have two people with the alert feet or two people with inspiring leader or even one person with inspiring leader and one person wants to do the uh, the charisma persuasion check to add another plus one um, only one person can do that, but all the inspiring leaders will uh, stack just to help kind of give the idea that you have a crew, uh, you have people who are able to help boost the morale of the crew. So now you can roll your initiative, uh, and once you have resolved who gets to go first, then we get to go to the combat step. And in the combat steps, I have a whole bunch of different things that can happen. Um, uh, basically, assume that every PC and named PC. That is like, if you have a, uh, a PC run NPC, um, they can all do something. So some people can be manning the weapons, some people can be running around repairing the ships, some people can be rerouting the powers in the ships. You'll see that in bold uh, letters that I am using tools and things that people are proficient in that we don't always get to use a lot. Like, how many people break out their tinkers tools or their jeweler's tools during a D&D game? Well, in this situation, I'm allowing you to use your tools proficiencies to help build or repair, fix a ship, reroute power. You know, like, the, who would have known? Like, I wrote that the, the jeweler's tools allows them to reroute power through the magical uh, weave that's around the ship. And they can reroute power to the, to the point where, you know, ones and twos on damage dice can now be uh, re-rolled. Or if a lot of people do it, then uh, ones and twos uh, can count as max damage um, instead of ones and twos uh, equal to your your uh, proficiency bonus. So, you know, it kind of gives the uh, it gives everybody the option to kind of help each other uh, and do cool things. Like the pilot can move. Uh, the pilot can also do evasive maneuvers. Basically, what happens here is with evasive maneuvers, uh, they can do half their movement rounded up. So with with slower moving ships, this is actually kind of helpful, more helpful to them than faster ships. Um, and they can add a plus two to their AC. And I'm not really doing advantage disadvantage when it comes to attacking and defending. It's more or less just flat pluses. Um, uh, here we have uh, superior positioning, so the pilot. Uh, can use their action to maneuver, allowing their guns to better hit their target. Uh, so they get a plus three to the gunners who are attacking. So that plus three would stack with anybody doing the inspiring leader feat uh, at the beginning of the game. So basically, if you really have to hit something, uh, you can, as a pilot, sacrifice some of your movement to allow to make it easier to hit. Uh, then we have like things like repairing ships. Uh, I gave anybody the option to uh, repair ships. If you have blacksmith tools or carpenter's tools, you can do 46 plus your proficiency bonus and a- expertise if you have that. But a crew member without it can do 2d6 worth of damage uh, repairing. So anybody can do it. Also, um, if you have mending, uh, you can treat ones, ones and twos rolled on your 2d6 as threes. Just to kind of give you a little bit of a... Uh, a reward for having mending, uh, and you can you can use your your magic skills to help kind of uh, get away with make it uh, basically not necessarily having proficiency in tools, um, but they do stack. So if you do have proficiency in blacksmith tools and mending, uh, that 46. If any of those are ones and twos, you can count them as threes. So 
Um, I really like that. We have bolster defenses, which basically boosts up the uh, uh, the damage threshold uh, because these uh, ships have damage thre thresholds. So you have to like, let's see, I'm looking at the damsel fly right now. What is their damage threshold? So you have to do at least 15 points of damage before you can start doing any damage to the hit points. Uh, and what bolster defenses does is you can bolster that damage th threshold uh, pr for that turn. Uh, they don't stack. You have to kind of... Um, they don't carry over to the next round, but more than one crew action doing this can stack. So in case like you're like on the last couple of hit points and you really need to not get hit, you can send half of your uh, crew trying to repair the ship and half of them trying to bolster defenses and uh, try to sacrifice your own attacks just to help with your own defense. Uh, so, on top of all that, I did change the way movement works. Um, it's six minute rounds, and that right here I wrote 25 foot blocks. It can be any uh, measurement unit that you want. This could be 25 meters, 25 yards, if you want, it can be 25 kilometers. That doesn't really matter so much. Uh, what matters is that the number in front uh, of them. So, and that's going to be very important for later on when you see my graph that I'm going to use to keep track of movement. But you'll see that I move, I rounded up or rounded down to the nearest 25 foot increments because that's how things are going to work. Uh, I also, let's see here, where did I put it? Here I uh, rounded up and rounded down. Uh, all the weapons as well to a 25 distance. If you want to count this 150 is 150 meters and 525 meters, that's fine too. Uh, again, I that doesn't really matter so much. It just matters uh, as long as all the distances are being used the same. So if, in case you don't want to use feet, if you're in a metric country and you want to use meters, that's fine too. Plus, uh, maybe it makes more sense that in six minutes a uh, ship would go 75 meters as opposed to 75 feet. So right now, this foot is just a placeholder, uh, and you can totally disregard that. Just worry about the number in front. Because we are not really going to worry about facing either. And why? It's because in six-minute turns, uh, think of your pilot being able to just kind of reorient your ship to where it needs to fight. Uh, your your weapons might be gimbaled, your pilot can just reorient yourself. So you don't have to worry about facing the right direction to broadside. Just always assume that you can get in the right direction to shoot your weapons. Um, that makes it much easier. You don't have to worry about uh, facing on like a hex grid or anything like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll see that my grid has nothing to do with facing, has everything to do with distances. Uh, so later on, <laughs> um, we will worry about crew members in battle because, uh, once your ships get within an adjacent, uh, square next to them, the, the boarding action can happen. And that is a sub step to the combat step. And I'll talk about crew members in battle in just a second. But let's say that you guys get into a battle. So your space galleon is up against uh, a damselfly. And that damselfly got within 25 feet of your space galleon. Well, now things break down into standard combat for D&D. They go to standard six-second rounds. And it is very uh, much like you and I know D&D combat to be. So we're not going to worry about what's going on with all the other ships in the world. Uh, right now, we're just going to break it down into those six second rounds that we know so well. Uh, and you'll see here that I have a whole bunch of different ways that you can uh, get onto other uh, ships. We have planks, we have rope swings, I have a whole bunch of rules written in here for using your rope, uh, rope swings. Uh, I have different ways that you can defend yourself uh, as a ship, as another ship is trying to board you. Caltrap siding, paint bombs, ducks for crossbow. Uh, just trying to keep, uh, trying to keep it simple, but also make it feel like a pirate 
you know, like pirates. Like, imagine going on the rope swing across to another ship uh, with a cutlass in your mouth while uh, some people on the ground are using their dex foot crossbows to try to kill a whole bunch of the crew that are trying to get onto the ship. So that's kind of a, a fun little way to make it more pirate shippy. <laughs> um, so uh, the way things happen here is uh, during combat, uh, space combat, I say at the end of the round, you're going to roll... So when your two ships are shooting at each other, at the end of the round, you're going to roll 1d4 minus 1 to see how many crew members die during the bombardment if your ship is hit. So if your ship takes a hit from uh, an enemy ship, roll a 1d4 minus 1 so you can have anywhere from 0 to 3 of your crew members die. Now your named PCs, or sorry, your named NPCs, the ones that like your PCs help control, um these like they have their stats written out they're immune to this this is for your standard uh no name npc crew members they have the commoner stats uh which is on monster manual page 345 which i have in here trying to keep things easy so you guys have all the page uh numbers so you can easily get to them um and you might get lucky and not have any crew members die or you might have up to three crew members die every round that would suck uh, but at the end uh, of that, and now that you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the way uh, named NPCs are, they're rolled into initiative just like they would be in standard ground combat. And no-name NPCs, uh, basically at the end of the round, you're going to roll a d6. And uh, if you roll a 1 on that d6... Uh, you're going to lose a crew member. Basically, that's to show that there is some attrition to combat. You know, your if your crew is boarding onto the ship of another crew, they're going to die. Uh, your named NPCs are immune from this. However, they can still die in regular combat because they're rolled into combat initiative. But uh, this this kind of helps push the players to want to get done with combat quicker because the longer they go the more of a chance they have to lose their crew members and uh so th that's very important um and uh please feel free to use any of this use none of it it's totally up to you i'm i'm totally fine with that um but uh i i uh you know i'm again i'm kind of humbled that you guys even want to see how i would do things uh, so, you know, take any of this with a grain of salt, do whatever you want with it, change things up. Um, that's perfectly awesome for me. Uh, here is a grid. Um, this is the grid that I plan on you guys printing out and cutting up to use for your space combat. And I'm going to show you how space combat works by jumping to real life me. So let's go see real life me. Pardon the uh, mess in the background, I now live in a farmhouse, and uh, we got a lot of stuff, so here we go. Okay, so this is the measurement rules grid that I'm giving you guys with my rule set. Let's pretend, well, let's say that this is you, and say that it is a space galleon, and you are going to be fighting a damselfly. Well, that damselfly is in 175 distance from your ballistae, meaning that you'll be shooting with disadvantage. But let's remember that Space Galleon has 50 feet of movement, so your pilot is going to move to make it so that you don't have disadvantage to shoot your ballistae at it. But instead of trying to move your Space Galleon marker, all we're going to do is move the damselfly closer to you. Because in, in the grand scheme of things, all that you did was move the distance closer. It doesn't matter if you move this or you move this. So let's always keep your ship in the same spot so you can always move the enemy ships uh, in relationship to you closer. Now let's say that a squid ship jumps into system and also wants to fight you. Well, this system doesn't have to only be 1v1. Let's say that the squid ship jumps in behind you at 275. Well, this doesn't matter where this is in relation to you in direction. 
All that matters is where it is in distance from you, because you can always turn your ship or gimbal your weapons to face it. So even if the damsel flies in front of you, and the squid ship is behind you, and the squid ship wanted to move closer to you, it doesn't matter where they are on this tracker, if it's in front or behind, just where they are in the distance away from you. Because remember, you can reorient yourself and your weapons are gimbaled, so you can always attack both of these guys if you need to. Simple as that, all you have to do is worry about how far away they are from you. And later on, I will add more uh, rules to my rules uh, compendium uh, for mass combat, because I think fleet combat would be really fun to do. And this rule system kind of breaks down with multiple ships attacking multiple targets. This is really good for one ship against multiple targets, as opposed to fleet versus fleet. So stay tuned for that. All right, so I hope that made sense. Um, but please let us know. I have in the pinned comments um, a link to our email address as well as our Twitter. You can leave questions, comments in the uh, comment section below. If you want to tweet at us, if you want to email us to ask us questions uh, for clarification, please, by all means, feel free to use this. Feel free, feel free to uh, change things up. Do whatever you want with this, not use it at all. But I just wanted to give you guys the option to see what I'm going to be using for space combat, or what I am using for space combat. I wrote these rules uh, quite a long time ago when I was doing my own homebrew spelljammer. Uh, this was back in like 2018, 2019, so uh, years before spelljammer was even announced. Um, so I thank you all very much for watching. Let me know if you like it, if you want more stuff like this. If you want more stuff like this, I'm thinking about maybe doing a Patreon. But I don't also feel good about charging people for this kind of stuff, so I don't know. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Once again, my name is Justin. I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. And as always, game on.